This was the historical distribution of wolves in the United States for hundreds of thousands of years. Wolves covered almost the entire country. And this is what the wolf distribution looked like by 1960. European settlers hunted them from a population of millions down to a desperate estimated 300 individuals. Their near extinction quickly set off a chain reaction of ecological imbalance that is still being felt today. But more recent efforts have fueled a wolf population rebound and debates have been swarming around reintroducing wolves to several more areas across the country. This idea has sent panic to locals, eager to preserve their livestock and personal safety. Last winter, seven of his cattle were killed by wolves. A wolf reintroduction could mean wolves living in almost our backyards. Environmentalists have pushed back, arguing the need for coexistence, ecological balance, and species preservation. How dangerous would a wolf reintroduction be? How would it even be done? And is it worth it? I had one in February that was 400 yards from my house. And I have four little girls that love to be outside. Wolves are what scientists call a keystone species, meaning their presence or absence has a vital impact on the entire ecosystem. Yellowstone National Park has served as an important case study. When the wolf population had been hunted out of the park by the 1920s, Elk populations soared to an estimated 17,000 individuals. They overgrazed the land, especially along riverbanks. Without trees and vegetation, erosion set in. Rivers widened. Species that relied on these plants, like beavers and birds, began to decline. Triggering what is known as a trophic cascade, a chain reaction affecting an entire ecosystem. Yellowstone spiraled into an imbalance. You see these sort of wastelands of completely overgrazed, overbrowsed plant communities. Elk populations became such a problem in Yellowstone that the National Park Service had to remove some themselves. In what was often referred to as a slaughter, in the winter of 1961 and 62, park rangers hunted down a whopping 4,000 elk. By the 1980s and 90s, scientists and conservationists began recognizing that reintroducing wolves could potentially restore ecological health to areas. After much debate, more on that in a minute, wolves were approved to be reintroduced to Yellowstone in January of 1995. Officially called the Northern Rocky Mountain Wolf Recovery Plan and led by biologist Mike Phillips, the reintroduction team brought 14 wolves in from Canada to Yellowstone's northern range. The snow is less high in the northern range relative to the southern portion of the park. And also the plant community is very abundant and it supports a huge number of prey species, including elk. Wolves were held in pens to acclimate to the region to prevent the likelihood that they would run back to Canada. And GPS collars were fitted to track their movements. 10 years later, the park saw the elk population cut in half from 17,000 to an estimated 8,000. Important vegetation like willows and cottonwoods regrew, and populations like beavers rebound. Many refer to and praise the reintroduction of wolves to Yellowstone as a landmark success. Yellowstone is often cited as the definitive example of how removing a keystone species can have dramatic cascading effects on imbalancing an ecosystem. But more importantly, Yellowstone demonstrates how reintroducing that same species can begin the process of ecological recovery. Hey, I'm Chris, founder of Green Valley Meals. I also wrote a book called How to Hike the Appalachian Trail. If you're an outdoor adventurer, you might be interested in our adventure meals, which are 650 calorie ready to eat meal bars. Think of them like a Rice Krispie Treat on steroids. Green Belly Meals, and these are these really delicious uh, bars. Check us out at greenbelly.com. Okay, back to the wolves. The gray wolf Canis lupus has been in North America for about a million years, originating from populations that crossed over from Eurasia during the last ice age. Over time, wolves spread across two thirds of the continent and most of the US, thriving in diverse ecosystems from dense forests to open prairies and deserts. Subspecies developed and some crossbred with coyotes, the categorizations of which are still being debated by scientists. For thousands of years, Native Americans and wolves coexisted. That changed when Europeans arrived in the 1600s. When they first landed on the shores of North America, best estimates are that there were anywhere from 1 million to 2 million gray wolves on the continent of North America. These settlers viewed the wolves' existence as a threat to their livestock, a threat to other game they wanted to hunt, and a threat to their human safety. Early European folklore didn't help, which portrayed the big bad wolf as inherently scary and dangerous. 
By the late 1800s, these eradication efforts were formalized through government-sponsored extermination programs. These extermination programs led to more widespread hunting, trapping, and poisoning. Animal carcasses were laced with cyanide or arsenic and left out as bait to poison hungry wolves. Wolves and other scavengers come in, eat the carcass, and then they die. This mass-scale persecution nearly drove wolves to extinction in the U.S. By the 1960s, the few hundred wolves that remained were limited to the most remote areas of Minnesota. It wasn't until the passage of the Endangered Species Act, or ESA, in 1973 that gray wolves were granted federal protection. This act laid the groundwork for their rebound by making it illegal to hunt or trap wolves in the United States. Today, there are an estimated 7,000 wolves in the United States in a handful of regions, a far cry from their historical population of more than a million across the country, but a drastic increase from near extinction over the last several decades. In the Northern Rockies, reintroduction efforts helped reestablish gray wolves across Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana, extending into eastern Washington and Oregon and up into Canada. So there was probably, you know, 2,800 to over 3,000 wolves in that big meta population. The Southwest has a small population of Mexican gray wolves remaining. This subspecies is one of the most endangered wolves in the U.S. The last count I saw was about 187 of them in Arizona and New Mexico. The Southeast has a critically endangered population of around 20 individual red wolves in North Carolina. The upper Midwest area, including Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin, is considered to have the largest and most resilient gray wolf population in the U.S. Those are the wolves that persisted through all of those many decades of persecution. Somewhere around 4,000-ish wolves. This is exciting, right? Wolves are back in ecosystems are improving and know that if you're lucky enough to see a wolf in Minnesota that animal is probably a descendant of that last stronghold of a few hundred individuals. Welcome back a Grand County Commissioner says a wolf has killed another cow the fifth one on the same ranch in less than two weeks. Despite these pockets of recovery the vast majority of the American wolf range that once was remains empty and despite the wolf recovery momentum reintroductions remain extremely controversial with strong opposition and support coming from both sides. Reintroduction advocates are eager to see wolves reclaim what they see as their rightful habitat and restore ecological balance. Reintroduction protesters argue for human and livestock safety. Even in the famous case of Yellowstone, locals, mostly ranchers in rural communities, organized and filed lawsuits against the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, claiming that the federal government had failed to consider the economic impact of the wolf reintroduction. And now another reintroduction is being proposed for Colorado with Proposition 114, which passed through a ballot initiative in November of 2020, recommending the release of 30 to 50 wolves over the next few years. And again, some locals are not in favor of the reintroduction and more specifically have been critical of how the process has been managed. Like Tim Richard, the president of the Middle Park Stock Growers Association in Colorado. I had one in February that was 400 yards from my house. And I have four little girls that love to be out. Like my oldest daughter is five years old and they love being outside playing with their horses and stuff. While wolf attacks are extremely rare, it understandably raises concern for human safety. However, wolf attacks on our pets and livestock are common and financially and emotionally taxing. It's deeply disturbing. And so it's more than just the economic consequences. There's also a lot of emotion around that. Even losing just a few animals could cost a rancher thousands of dollars a year. And once the wolves prey on livestock, they often become dependent on that relatively easy to catch prey. Since Christmas on, I bet we're over 30 animals that have been killed by these wolves. Many are suggesting the use of non-lethal deterrents like guard dogs, bright lights, and loud noises but these methods aren't as effective as some would like. Wolves are quick learners and ranchers have to constantly change up their deterrent methods to keep the wolves away. And when all else fails, the wolf has to be euthanized. It's eerie as heck up here. You have to get rid of problem wolves. When they get to that point where they're habituated like that, they're not afraid, they don't run off. Some feel like these are the growing pains of learning to live with predators once again, and that these solutions are the compromises necessary for us to exist alongside wolves. If you think about what has been lost in the intervening 
few hundred years. The loss of knowledge about what it means to live with predators, and it takes a while for that knowledge to be regained. Some have gone as far as to say that reintroductions aren't as effective at restoring ecosystems as once thought. And even the poster child of wolf reintroductions, Yellowstone, has come under scrutiny. Some saying there were more variables at play that contributed to the decline of the elk population, other than just adding wolves. Notably, extremely harsh winters, which can naturally remove thousands of elk in a single season. And for this reason, some elk hunters have not been in favor of reintroducing wolves into what they view as an already limited population. The question of ecological balance is a very difficult one. In the intervening decades that wolves went back into Yellowstone, lots of other things have happened. Climate change, massive disease and decline of critical plant species. And this recent study suggests that some of Yellowstone's ecosystem has been permanently damaged, suggesting even with the reintroduction of wolves, some of it will never be able to fully recover and that the health of an ecosystem is much more complex than the presence or absence of a single species. There are indicators of balance between these prey predator plant systems, um, but please understand that there's a lot of other things influencing any environmental context or any ecosystem. After researching this video, one thing became clear. The wolf reintroduction movement is extremely complicated. It's not as simple as more wolves mean a better ecosystem, nor is it as simple as less wolves are better for humans. There are many nuanced considerations coming from many perspectives, and that makes the issue hard to address. However, Yellowstone and the Northern Rockies have been successful at increasing the wolf populations, and at least to some degree improving their respective ecosystems. And this has led to many environmentalists across the globe pushing for more wildlife reintroductions, usually to core habitats where certain species have been known to thrive historically, also known as the rewilding movement, or the idea that natural ecosystems should be allowed to manage themselves with minimal human intervention, usually targeting keystone species like apex predators and large herbivores, like jaguars in the southwest, and the California condor, and more bison in the Great Plains. Or internationally, like reviving bears and lynx in Europe, beavers in the UK, and wild horses in Mongolia. The wolf reintroduction debate is symbolic. It challenges us as a society to consider how integrated do we want the wilderness to be with our society, and consider the compromises we're willing to make in order to achieve that level of coexistence. The bigger picture to me is, what are we going to do about the biodiversity extinction crisis? What are we doing about it? What are the ways in which we can offset decline of species? What do you think? Do we want to fight for an important species that has lived here for hundreds of thousands of years and barely survived our early settlers, or should we be more humanist and prioritize more of our wants and needs as humans? We're a small team that loves the outdoors. If you like this, we'd love it if you gave us a like and subscribe. A big, big thanks to Joanna and Tim for their help researching this video. <laughs> Crush that subscribe. Some people do this, others do Some this.